Welcome to the Impact on the Ground podcast series. I'm Tiia Sammalahti, CEO of whatimpact.com. In this podcast series, we'll dig deeper into what it takes to make an impactful change in our society. I'll give a voice to charities, social enterprises, companies, grant makers, individuals and government officials who all have one thing in common. They are keen to make a difference. We dive into practical solutions and observe the dynamics of those who have resources to give and those working with the beneficiaries on the ground. Let's start making an impact together. Hello, everybody. Today we have a special guest, Alastair Jackson, who is the CEO of a charity called Recycling Lives. Welcome. Hi, nice to see you. Yeah, it's it's great to meet you and and um, and hear about your fantastic charity who does uh, so many things. So why don't you introduce your organization to the listeners? Of course, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to to speak. So, Recycling Lives Charity has has been around now since about two thousand and eight. We were actually created out of a, a business that was a recycling business that pre existed, not a charity. I'm uh, back in 2008. We we because I used to work for the business decided to create a charity so we could we could actually affect the lives of people and 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 make some real changes and and it's grown from there. So we we started with with a, a residential um, program for homeless men. So we have here in Preston where I'm based a 10 bedroom accommodation where where men live with us. It's their home. They don't drop in and out. It is their home and they live here for as long as they need, generally about 12 months, go through a, a six stage program of getting from basic needs like doctors, dentists, bank accounts, that kind of very basic thing that we all take for granted through to work programs, work experience. And at the end of that program, when they're ready, we help them get into their own accommodation and into a job. So that was the starter for the charity back in 2008. Then over the years, we've added various things on. We now have one of the biggest rehabilitation programs in, in the country, working with men and women who are both in prison and put on release. So we run, uh, we have seven different workshops, recycling, um, electric waste, so TVs, computers, gas meters, laptops, um, wireless hubs, things like that. And we use that product to employ men and women inside prison to develop their work ethic, their self-esteem. And then we have a whole team of people that I can talk about later to support those men and women on their journey through prison and upon release and into the community so they can be the best that they can be um, and help them into independent living and more, most importantly, not go back to prison. Um, we've, we've been doing that for a long time now. Um, thousands of people have gone through that program and I'm um, I'm really proud to say our reoffending rate is incredibly low. It's around a five percent compared nationally to mass- massively more than that. Um, so that that's the kind of the second and probably the biggest program we do. And then we also work in partnership with Fair Share. And um, so Fair Share are a national food redistribution, food surplus redistribution organisation. We work with them and we run uh, Fair Share for Lancashire and Cumbria. So we have a warehouse here again in Preston. We receive food in. From uh, surplus food from manufacturers, retailers, growers, uh, and then we work with around about 150 odd community groups across Lancashire and Cumbria. They might be social supermarkets, they might be food banks, they might be school breakfast clubs, you name it, as long as it's not for profit that use food. And we get that food to them uh, for their service users and participants. We redistribute around about 3 million meals worth every single year. Um, so that's kind of the third thing. And then we do other things as well. We have a we have a community cafe. We have a training kitchen that we partner with Jamie Oliver's Ministry of Food, where we train people on the basics of cooking um, and, and a bit more. Um, we've added other things in the rehabilitation space. So as well as the workshops, we do wraparound support for people who might not be in our workshops. Some people who are really struggling with drugs and alcohol mental health so yeah a real wide range of things aimed at helping people in the homelessness rehabilitation and food poverty uh spheres if you like wow that that is a lot but uh, amazing work and and this ex-offender you know uh situation you know it's quite bad isn't it that if you don't get support you know it's uh it's very easy to that you know kind of go back to the 
life of crime and and get back inside and and that's a bad cycle um so i was yeah over over 50 percent of people who come out of prison go back again within oh that's within that's 12 bad. months so yeah the more we can help those people taking aside what they've done and what they haven't done but, but, but the more that we can help those people when they're coming out uh better is for them as individuals better is for the families and better actually for society as a whole because yes, uh, if course. you're not committing more crime you you that that's good for society and if you're becoming a citizen the same as anybody else then you're adding value to society so it's it's an absolute no-brainer to us yeah absolutely so um uh, i just look at some statistics and uh, there are approximately eighty-five thousand prisoners in the uk yeah. uh, currently yeah, that's right. and uh quite large numbers uh, are, are actually let's say 20 uh, to 40 years old so people in in their prime kind of working yeah and so that's like 50,000 so over half half of the people are in 20s or or 30s and and of course you know it, it's so important to get these people back to kind of not the life of crime but also getting employed and you know kind of have that second second chance in in their lives uh, which then can you know lead to decades of uh, of good life and and uh, you know kind of being able to be parent to children and 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 so forth so um what is the kind of you know what is the obstacle for ex offenders to really get the work is there a lot of prejudice or is it kind of their life situation in general that they need more support so a bit of both the the, the still remains stigma around anyone that might have committed a crime and especially people who've gone to prison for crime um that's improved i mean we, we've been doing this work for a, a long time now and, and actually there are more people who will look past that background than, than before but still there is a stigma if, if you as an individual on your own try and get into a job with a criminal record it can be very difficult and often doors are shut in your face before you even get to the point of getting an interview or beyond so that, that that's that's the first major issue as you rightly say as well a lot of people that are in prison not everybody but a lot of people may not have worked before they might come from chaotic backgrounds they might not be used to it they might clearly being in prison is a massive massive thing and that affects self-esteem confidence so it's it's kind of building the those well i guess you call them building blocks that we take for granted of feeling confident enough that you that you can add to uh, a company a business uh, in a positive way having that self-esteem so our, and our job therefore is to help in whatever way we can to get people ready that when they present for an interview and when they go to a job they're as good as the next person who may have no criminal background whatsoever so there's lots of things that goes into that but they're the two main barriers i i think self-esteem confidence and stigma i think are the, are the big things that, that we we help with so when like a uh, companies private sector companies you know, consider uh, hiring ex-offenders. What do they um, kind of have to consider in that? How should they be prepared, like in a different way than uh, hiring non-offender? And uh, what do you think that, you know, uh, how should it be arranged kind of, should the companies work more with your type of organizations or can they build this kind of uh, capacity and capability themselves? Well, I think, you can do it yourself, but it's it's much more difficult to do it that way. And and there are a lot of organizations out there with expertise in working with this kind of cohort. So why not work in partnership and do it together? Um, it's very, in terms of the actual process, you should treat anyone who's coming out of prison exactly the same as you would do anybody else in terms of interview. It shouldn't be, they should be the best person for the job when you get the interview. I'm not, I, I don't think we'd ever advocate that someone gets a job just because they have a label that that would be wrong. Yeah. But once you, once you've looked at that and you decide that this person is the best person, it's kind of being prepared for what may happen. Everybody has wobbles in their life. Everybody does, but someone who's been in prison for a short or long time will inevitably have wobbles uh, when they come out into the community and, and, it's, it's being ready and understanding when they might happen, if they might happen, signs of what might happen. And these are not generally serious things. These are not kind of 
people coming out and committing more crime in 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 your business or your company it's more mentally sometimes you might you you might have a day where you think wow this was a bit too overwhelming and it's how you can how HR departments can can deal with that. So what we do as an organization is we work with the men and women themselves to help grow the confidence and grow the skills. But we also offer a service to businesses and companies who want to take our men and women on and hold their hands through the process effectively. So talk with them about how you should talk to your existing staff about we're on a journey and we're going to work with uh, bringing people who've, who've got a prison background that should be an open and honest conversation it should be something that is talked about and not forced onto a, an existing staff force but then after that once that decision's been made that that there shouldn't be any special measures saying here here's, here's an ex-offender coming through the door that that's the worst possible thing you can do um but we will manage as as a charity we will manage the expectations and we will manage with the managers and the directors of a business, uh, the whole disclosure piece, so you know the background. And actually, one of the one of the advantages of working in with people um, that we work with is you will know a lot more about them than you would know about someone who came through a standard approach. So if, if I mean, I, I've run run businesses before and, and hired people. When when you get an, a CV or, or an application form through, all you know is what's on that application form and CV. So the the candidate can choose to tell you whatever they want, and then you bring them to interview, and they tell you whatever they want to tell you, and that's all you will ever know about them. Whereas somebody coming through a program like ours, you'll know everything because we've disclosed it, and you'll know their background, you'll know what makes them tick, you know what they've done wrong in the past, and you'll know how they've worked to change their life. So actually, there's sometimes there's an advantage that you will know more, and. What I would say, and, and we did this as a business before we set up the charity, we, we employed ex-offenders, is when a business or organization gives somebody a chance that's from this kind of background, 99 times out of 100, you get back what you've given tenfold or a hundredfold. You get somebody who's incredibly hardworking, incredibly loyal, because you're the person that's given them a chance when others... It, others wouldn't i didn't understand this in the very beginning when we did it as a business i just thought we were giving someone a job etc and i remember with the first guy we ever took on uh, a guy called sergio he talked to me a few months after he'd been there he said what you've done has changed my life i i hadn't changed i didn't change his life i, I think he changed his own life but he said the opportunity you gave me as a business to be valued to work like anything else has changed my life and means I can come to work, I can stand tall, I can be proud and I'm not going back to a life of crime. And he, because of that faith that we showed him and because of that chance we'd given him, worked so hard and stayed with the company for 15 years. Oh um, <laughs> and that's the kind of, that doesn't happen every single time, clearly, and, and there's, yeah. there's, there's highs and there's lows, but that's the kind of impact you can have. Um, so yeah, but doing it alone, really, really hard. Why, why bother? Why, why add to the problems of your HR department that's already dealing with this, that, and the other? Why not work with a, a partner charity like ourselves that can help you through that, that whole journey? Yeah, and I guess also uh, it's so important that people have these other things in order, you know, even accommodation, a home, you know. Yeah. You know, job cannot solve all the problems. <laughs> of course, it's, it leads to then getting money and being able to, you know, get that place. But to begin with, you know, the situation has to be somewhat stable that you can actually handle that job. 100%. And, and we, yeah. we have an accommodation officer who, who makes sure that people are in, find the right accommodation for them, whether it be shared accommodation, whether it be their own house, whatever it happens to be. So... Yeah, a HR department of a business doesn't want to be dealing with trying to work out where some one of their employees is going to live. That, that's what we do as standard, and that's all done before somebody would even present for an interview. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so, that, is, um, that is a very valid the, point. What are the collaboration models then? If a private sector company wishes now to collaborate, uh, what kind of uh, collaboration it is do you... Uh, there will be some fees, uh, you know, kind of donations, you, uh, you know, how do they kind of pay for your services and what other kind of collaboration models you have than uh, kind of these kind of monetary? Okay. So there's, there's, there's kind of a few different ways. There's, there's the, the, 
we're not a recruitment agency, so we don't charge fees like a recruitment agency does because we're about the individual. So the individuals you work with, we work with for free because we're a charity and, and we always will do. But also those individuals are not like a recruitment agency where there's loads of people ready and, and if they're, they're ready when they're ready. So we, we, we're not a recruitment agency, let me put it out there. And we don't charge a fee to businesses to work with our individuals. What we say is... Let's work together. Let's work out who is going to, what vacancies that you've got, who within our participant group might be a good fit. We'll prepare them for interview. We'll work with you on interview. We'll do all of the disclosure and, and we'll charge you no pounds and no pence. However, if you're happy with the work that we've done and you're happy with the person that comes through, we'd love you to make a donation because we, we can't exist without people helping us. So there's no formal contract, no charge. Um, and our support continues for as long as you need our support. But yeah, a donation is, is, is for, for that service would be one way of doing it. Um, so that's, that's the most basic level of creating jobs and having that kind of thing. There is um, a model where the workshops that I talked about at the beginning of the, of the podcast, we, we don't have contracts with, with, uh, uh, with companies general with with councils that are creating tv waste and all that kind of stuff we work with companies who have those contracts and we and we do that on their behalf so one of the things we're really keen on on exploring is actually what businesses out there what organizations out there could replicate some of the work that they're doing in a prison and we could partner and create another prison workshop or another community workshop and what i mean by that is the first prison workshop we ever created, we were already doing the recycling work out in the community, nothing to do with working in prison. It was work that needed doing, but we found actually, um, we thought, well, actually we could do more work if we, if we had more people, but let's connect it with the charitable stuff and let's do it with an ex-offender population and create more work, but more impact. And so we simply replicated the recycling of the TV model from the outside of the prison and put it in a prison so my challenge to to people out there is actually have a think about in your organization what could what is there within your organization that could be replicated because then you could be training your own men and women from scratch in a prison program doing your product whether it be recycling it whether it be fabricating it whether it be making it might be a call center whatever it happens to be and then partner with a charity like us that can do the wraparound support so you're not having to do it. You then get a product done that you need doing that will create an income for you, curating your next lot of employees who are already trained before you get out. So that for me is the magic, the magic bullet. And we do that with a few organizations where we, we support that work and that creates a throughput of people. Uh, so that, that that's another way of working together. I'm really keen to do more of that. Then again, pure financial donation. If you just want to support what we do, we're always up for sponsoring and we kind of give in case studies and social impact reports and all that kind of stuff on the back of that. And then we haven't talked about our food work yet. I guess we could get onto that. Um, so in the food work, we're always looking for, we rely on volunteers. We cannot do our food work without, without volunteers. We have a, a staff team of seven, but effectively on any given day, we need 30 people to make that, make that warehouse work. So individual volunteers, corporate volunteers um we're absolutely reliant on if there are organizations out there that have food that's surplus then we'd love to talk to them because we can get that food surplus to people who really need it um and yeah that covering covering the sponsorship and the bills that come with that helping us with vehicles with that just all like the, the usual kind of thing there's many many ways that you can link up with us okay about the volunteering um uh, you know obviously you need like physical on on location volunteers so what was yeah. the operational op area that you operate in so in, in terms of the food it's in, it's a warehouse in preston so physically in preston though volunteering we, we have van drivers going up and down to cumbria every day so the, the well that is based from preston and going up and down in terms of volunteering with some of our criminal justice work we're again um our headquarters are mainly based in Preston. We have prisons dotted around the north of England, but not really many volunteering opportunities in there. Um, 
also volunteering and mentoring. So mentoring, doing mock interviews for, for, for our people. That could be anywhere, wherever you're based. They can be done over yeah, teams. Online. It's always a, it's always a great thing if, if our participants can practice an interview before they go into an interview. So, yeah, online, that could be done often. Um, but in terms of physical operations, volunteering generally in Preston and Lancashire. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's a lot of opportunities. And I, I find this intriguing. Like you said, that there could be even like a, let's say, customer care, customer service center. Could yeah, I mean, that, 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 from, the, from the prison and uh, yeah. people could get uh, then, you know, they could get training for your products and, and whatever the industry would be. But um yeah, that kind of uh, just makes sense. And yeah, uh, it doesn't have to. I, I, it doesn't have to be recycling. There's lots of different yeah. things that are done. I mean, you think of Timpsons that they're doing shoe repair and, and all that kind of thing. The, the, there's loads of different companies. There are call centers in prisons. Think think of prisons as an untapped resource. Yes. So the, the, there are eighty five thousand people in there, as you said. Now, not everybody is ready for work. Far from it. Yeah. And not everybody is going to be coming out uh in the near future but lots of people are yeah um, it, it's in the news all the time now that prisons are overcrowded and people being released early there's more people being released so why not let's help them and let's challenge ourselves and actually what you get and let's and this is really important as well we, people should do it for the right reasons in terms of helping people but it helps your business let's face it i mean what impact that's what it's for yeah companies yeah. want and need to talk about social impact yeah. and created social impact by partnering with organizations like us will win you contracts it's as yeah. simple as that recycling lives the business that i talked about at the beginning that was a recycling company yeah. grew substantially after it started working after it set up a charity and started helping people yeah because businesses wanted to work with a company like that so yeah. it's it's an absolute no-brainer you, you get to help people and help yourself at the same time and what's wrong with that yeah Wow. Well, that's great. And we are so happy that uh, Recycling Life, uh, Lives is now on whatimpact.com platform as well. And um, and uh, you already mentioned about the capability of reporting. Well, our impact reporting is quite uh, comprehensive, but it's your data that you will be putting in there. And that's then, you know, comes against every single donation and, and volunteering effort and, and in-kind donation. So, so the the companies get then uh, kind of the the impact reports to be distributed and and the stories to be utilized in their promotion or or, or internal communication. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you so much for this session, and um, you know I wish you all all the best, and we we surely hope that you will get uh, new contacts. Uh, after this podcast and and we will be promoting you on our newsletters and so forth thank you pleasure, thank pleasure you and thank much. you for the opportunity thank you